Okay, good morning, everyone. Well, good morning from Montreal, and good afternoon, Ali. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, first, I just want to say um, thanks for inviting me to give a talk and talk to you about um, some, of the, some of the work I do here in Montserrat. Um, I can get the slideshow going. Let me see. Hang on a second. Okay, hopefully you can all see the first slide now. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about some of the work I do here in Montserrat and hopefully how I can show you that some of the skills and things you learn during your PhD can be used um, in, a, in a role that's not totally academic. Um, there's plenty of other aspects of my job and that's what I'm going to try and explain to you this morning. So just a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, firstly, give you a little bit of introduction. Um, and background both to Montserrat and the Sufra Hills Volcano, and then also a little bit more about the observatory, um, who we are and what we do, um, before moving on more to talk about my role as the volcano seismologist and talk about some of the non-academic sort of non-research aspects of, of the job, which is kind of cover some of the more operational, technical, and sort of extracurricular things that, that go along with um, the purely academic side of, of, of the job. So yeah, firstly, just a little bit of background about Montserrat and about the Sufra Hills Volcano. So um, for those of you who aren't really familiar with the Caribbean, um, Montserrat is up here in this, hopefully you can see on the pointer, in this northern part of the, of the Lesser Antilles. This is the Lesser Antilles Volcanic Arc. It's on the eastern margin of the, of the Caribbean plates. Um, it's at a convergent plate mar margin, a subduction zone, where the North American plate is being um, beneath the Caribbean plate and producing this lovely chain of volcanic islands um, on the eastern edge of the plate. Um, so if we take a look in a little bit more detail at the eastern Caribbean and, and, and the volcanic arc, um, you can see we have a whole chain of, of islands running from, from Sabre in the north all the way down to Grenada in the south. Um, there is a slightly bifurcation in older part of the arc in the north. Um, but all of these from Sabre down to Grenada are potentially active systems. Um, the only sort of currently active volcanoes in the region is obviously Sufra Hills, but also we have a submarine volcano called Kikum Jenny just offshore north of Grenada that's been active over the last few years. Um, but also historically, um, the region's produced some quite significant volcanic eruptions, notably um, eruption of Montpellier in Martinique in 1902, and a bit more recently in St. Vincent in 1979. Um, and also because it's a tectonically active region, um, it's, the, the plate is boundaries capable of producing quite large regional earthquakes. And these are some of the more notable regional earthquakes that have taken place in the Caribbean over the last few decades. So zooming in now to look at Montserrat in a little bit more detail, um, it's quite a small island. It's maybe 16 kilometers long by about 10 kilometers wide. Um, and it's really composed of four main volcanic complexes. The, the oldest, Part of the island is right up in the north, Silver Hills. This is somewhere in the region of one to three million years old. Um, the next oldest part is Centre Hills. This complex may be a million to half million years old. But then all of the most recent volcanism has taken place in the south around, this is Sufra Hills here, in the last quarter of a million years. Um, we also had this short-lived episode of more uh, basaltic, basaltic andesite um, volcanic activity that occurred about 120,000 years ago this area we call South Sufra Hills. Um, but since then, really all the major, all the activity is really focused um, around this Sufra Hills complex, which is a series of, of older domes surrounding the, the current active dome. Um, so just to kind of guide you through some of the history of the current eruption, um, so taken from the tourist map, this is what Montserrat looked like um, in 1995, prior to the beginning of the current eruption. So you can see it's all very nice and green. It's nicknamed the Emerald Isle of the Caribbean. Um, we zoom in and look at the southern part. You can see the River Hills was all completely vegetated. This was what we call English's Crater, former English's Crater that was a collapse scar from a sector collapse maybe about 10,000 years ago. And this contained a small little dome that we called, that was called Castle Peak. Um, and this is just Chances Peak, which was previously the highest point on the island, but is now kind of 
a few hundred meters below the summit of the current dome, which you'll see in a moment. Um, the beginning in 1995, we call this um, sort of increase of seismicity leading up to the start of the eruption. Um, prior to that, over the 20th century, there'd been a sort of roughly 30 year cycle of um, what we call volcano seismic crises. So there was increased earthquake activity on Montserrat um, around about 1890s, 1930s, 1960s, um, but they didn't lead to any, any eruption. Um, but then this, uh, the activity that began sort of in the early 90s um, really was see, led up to the start of the eruption, which began in 1995, so 23 years ago. Um, so you can see from 92 to 95, we had this sort of general pattern of increasing um, seismicity, which was the first sort of major precursors to, to the start of the eruption. Um, so the first activity was um, phreatic or phreatomagmatic, so involving um, the groundwater being heated up and interacting with the magma as it's rising to the surface. And this produced, um, as you can see in the picture, some little um, steam plumes and small phreatomagmatic explosions and, and some lahars. And this was the real first sign of activity. Um, I mean, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about the whole course of the eruption. Um, I'm going to describe it really briefly because I want to focus more on, on, on my role. But just to give you a uh, summary, uh, really what we've had is, is five phases since then of, what we, of lava extrusion, what we call phases. So this is periods when um, lava has been extruded at the dome surface. Um, and we've had cycles of basically growing lava domes of viscous andesite lava that piles up on top of the vent, grows a lava dome, and then has, has collapsed. Um, and you can see in this picture, um, this is a before and after shot. Um, from the largest dome collapse we've had. This was in 2003. You can see the whole top of the dome. This was maybe 200 million cubic meters of material collapsed over this <clears throat> in the course of a day or so down to the eastern side. This was the largest dome collapse we've had during, during the eruption. So to try and sort of summarize all that, we use what we call our, our megaplot that really puts all of our key monitoring data or tries to put it onto, onto one plot. I don't know if some of you may have seen this before, but um, so this is really showing a timeline from the beginning of the eruption, 1995, through to the present day. And, and the colors, first of all, is the, is, the, is the different periods or phases of the eruption. So these periods in pink are when we've had lava extrusion at the surface. And then periods in green is like at the moment when we have relative quiescence and, and no lava being extruded at the surface. And then the three different panels show um, our three different uh, key monitoring data. So the top plot is the seismicity. This is the number of total number of volcanic earthquakes per day. Um, and you can see these are generally much higher during the extrusive phases. This is because it's dominated by pyroclastic flow and rockfall signals when the dome is growing um, and shedding material. Um, I'll come back to the deformation. And um, the bottom plot shows the, the gas output. This is uh, SO2. This is the primary gas species that we, that we measure. Um, and you can see that this, um, is pumping out sometimes several thousand tons of, of sulfur per day. Um, and it's had these one to two year cycles as well that don't necessarily match up with what's happening on the surface. So probably related to some deeper processes um, within the magma reservoir. Um, but the sort of long-term average has been around three or 400 tons per day of, of sulfur dioxide. And if we then move up to look at probably the most impressive of the three is this middle panel showing the ground deformation data. So this is um, GPS data taken from uh, the red line is a station in the north of the island. So this is the horizontal component of that station uh, in a, relative to the volcano. So what you can see is that um, during these uh, green periods, the pause periods, we have um, the line is going up. So this is a, an inflationary type signal, first order um, signal, this inflation, followed by during uh, extrusive phases, we see the opposite. We see a collapse or subsidence or deflation signal. Um, and this sort of remarkable sawtooth pattern has kind of fitted very well with the surface activity. And, and what we see is this, yeah, alternating inflation and deflation cycles that are sort of first approximation to it. So the current situation, you can see the last phase, phase five ended um, in 2010. Um, but since then, we've had more than eight years now of uh, not really any surface activity. Well, some small amounts of ash venting, but no magma the surface for more than eight years, but we're still seeing slow inflation um, from the GPS data. We're still producing three or 400 tons per day of sulfur dioxide, which is sort of way above 
the background level that we was there before the eruption, and we're still getting occasional bursts of, of small uh, earthquakes. So what that's really telling us is uh, we think that obviously there's no immediate signs that extrusion is about to restart, but at the same time, um, it's clearly there's still a, a quite a, a large potential for a restart to happen given this ongoing geophysical signal. So if I could, if I could lift the cloud up and show you what it looked like out the window. It's a little cloudy today. This is what um, Sufra Hills volcano looks like from the observatory. You can see um, top of the lava dome, and this main feature is is, is the collapse scar from 2010. Um, so just coming looking a little bit more detail, this is the main uh, morphological feature on the lava dome at the moment, this north-south oriented collapse scar that formed um, during this partial collapse of the dome in 2010. Um, it's about a mile or so long and it's got a very steep, almost vertical headwall at the back in this, in this area. Um, so you can see I mentioned earlier Chances Peak. This is formerly the highest point on the island here and it's maybe 200 meters or so below the, the, the current um, summit of the dome. So that's just a very quick summary of the, of the eruption and, and the status of the, of the volcano at the moment. Um, you can see that from the satellite photo taken um, shortly after the last, the last explosion in 2010, um, the, the, the area is impacted by, by the eruption. So it's a false killer satellite image, so vegetation shows up as red, um, but all these gray and white areas are areas that have been impacted by ash and pyroclastic flows from the volcano. So you can really see it is sort of southern two thirds of the island has been has been severely impacted. So I'm now going to move on and talk a little bit about the observatory, about MVO, sort of who we are and what we do. Um, so firstly, it's sort of the origins of MVO. It was basically was born as the eruption started in 1995. Um, and the first response was by scientists from SRU, the Seismic Research Unit, which is now the Seismic Research Center which is part of the University, University of the West Indies based in Trinidad. Um, but it was also quite an international team at the beginning. There was volcanologists coming from, from, from France, from the French observatories in Martinique and Guadeloupe, from, from the US, uh, from the US Geological Survey, the VDAP team, as well as scientists from the UK, from the British Geological Survey. So it was quite a, um, a wide mix of people who were here at the beginning um, of the crisis. Um, so originally the observatory was Sufra Hills Volcano Observatory, but it became um, MVO, the Montserrat Volcano Observatory, and it's uh, moved around uh, a few times and um, started off in Plymouth, but um, it's been in its current purpose-built location now since about 2002. So MVO now, what are we? Well, it was formally established as a statutory body of the government of Montserrat in 1999. Um, the funding is through the government, but ultimately comes from, from the UK via DFID, the Department for International Development. Um, and the directors, it basically has uh, the governor of the island, the premier, and also the chairman of the SAC are part of the, the main board. Um, and it's been managed under a contract since 2008 now by the Seismic Research Centre, um, which is based in Trinidad and part of the University of the West Indies. Um, and that agency is responsible for monitoring all of the English speaking islands in the Caribbean for volcanic and sort of seismic activity. So we have six scientific support staff, um, scientific full-time academic scientific staff I'm going to talk about in a moment, and as well as 10 other um, local te technical and other scientific and admin support staff. Our main function is obviously to monitor the volcano, and we do this to provide advice um, to the people and the government of Montserrat. That's the, really the core uh, role of it. But we also do um, a lot of educa education and outreach, both sort of locally with schools, et cetera, here, but with many other educational institutions and visiting groups from all over the world that come and visit and talk to us. Um, and then also, because we're part of the Seismic Research Centre and the university, we also um, do a lot of research. All six of us, the academic staff, have our own research interests and projects, but we collaborate on a whole range of different projects with um, other partners and institutions from all over the world that come and do research here on the volcano and on Montserrat. So in terms of monitoring, um, here's just a sort of list of some of the, the, the different monitoring equipment we have. Um, the ones highlighted in bold is really our, our core three techniques, monitoring of the seismicity, the earthquake activity, monitoring of ground deformation through continuous GPS, and monitoring of the gas output, the SO2 mainly through something called DOAS, which is basically a spectroscopy to measure the concentration of gas in the gas plume. Um, but we have these whole host of other techniques that we, that we use as well. EDM is electronic distance measurement, so a laser rangefinder, 
can measure the distance to reflectors on different parts of the lava dome. We have a multi-gas instrument to measure different gas species as well. Uh, remote cameras, thermal cameras that we can take in the field as well to go and look at the temperature of different features, the fumaroles, et cetera, um, as well as infrasound, um, strain meters, tilt meters, um, and other different techniques. Um, I guess observations is also very key, visual observations from the observatory and also via the helicopter that we thankfully very lucky to have a helicopter one day a week to go and take visual observations um, of the lava dome and look for any changes. So that's kind of the, the whole range of different techniques that we use, but I'm really gonna, obviously in this talk, focus more on, on the seismicity, on the seismic aspect. Um, so in terms of the staff, as I was mentioning, the six academic staff, each with a sort of different area of responsibility. Uh, we have Rod Stewart, who's our director with overall responsibility. We have Dr. Thomas Christopher, who's our gas and geochemistry expert. Uh, we have Dr. Karen Pascal, some of you may know, another former Leeds PhD student, who's our deformation and geodesy expert. Uh, myself, who looks at the seismology. Uh, we have Adam Stinton, who looks at anything to do with the size and shape of the dome, although he's currently on sabbatical in Bristol. Um, so we have uh, Dr. Stuart Hatter here covering at the moment. And our newest staff member is Victoria Miller, who's here to work more on the hazard and risk assessment aspects. Um, so we are all employees of Seismic Research Centre, uh, University of West Indies, and we have a dual monitoring and, and research role, which I'm gonna explain now in a bit more detail. Okay, so moving on now to talk about my role as the volcanic seismologist. As I mentioned, it's really this split dual uh, role in terms of doing pure academic and scientific research. I'm mainly focusing on seismicity here on the volcano, but also the other core part of it is, is the monitoring, the more operational side of things. And really I'm gonna focus on this, this second aspect for, for the rest of the talk. So now just to move on and talk about the more operational duties that I, that I, that I have, um, it's really yet yeah, focused on seismic monitoring of the volcano. And this sort of core aspect of it really is looking for um, the seismic signals produced by the volcano and giving an interpretation of, of those. Um, and this mainly comes through basically looking at triggered seismic events, looking at their waveforms to classify them, um, and that helps us um, interpret the state of the volcano. And I kind of do this together with my, my fabulous colleague, Venus Bass, who is our seismic technician. Um, and the two of us are really uh, responsible for this analyzing, classifying, and looking at and monitoring the seismic signals produced by the volcano. So just to kind of give you an idea of how we do that, um, to get quick overviews of the level of activity, we use what we call helicorder plots. Um, we no longer use the old drum style recorders with the rotating drum and paper records. Everything is done digitally, but we still like to use the same, same sort of style of presentation because everyone's very familiar with it. So we use these electronic helicorder plots that show one day of activity at a particular station. Um, so this is 24 hours here. So you can see it starts in the top left-hand corner. Each line going across is 10 minutes and it goes from midnight to midnight um, UTC time. So this is fairly typical of activity at the moment, maybe one or two very small earthquakes per day, but activity has been very low for the past few months, years really. Um, but just to show you what it can look like when it's extremely active, this is a, a helicopter from the last phase of activity from the large explosion at the end of phase five. And you can see the really very high amplitude signals um, from lots of pyroclastic flow and rockfall signals. And then this large signal from the explosion, volcanic explosion and, and partial collapse of the dome. So really it can be very variable in terms of the activity from basically very little happening to hundreds of events per day and lots of signals to deal with. Um, so what do we do as well as just obviously glancing and having a very quick overview, we can look in a lot more detail at some of these individual signals. Um, and one of the main ways we do that is through what we call classifying uh, volcanic events. So volcanoes can produce a whole range of different types of events, not just normal tectonic earthquakes, um, but signals with different characteristics and different source processes. So these are the main different uh, types that we have. The system of used here, and I think at several other observatories around the world, is really this um, classification of the different signals based on their, their waveform characteristics and their, and their spectra, the amplitude spectra, the different frequencies contained in the signal. Um, so these are the main types. This top one shows what we call a VT, a volcano tectonic event. This is 
uh, brittle failure event, very similar to an ordinary tectonic earthquake, it just happens to occur in or around or underneath the volcano. Um, the other types, these hybrid and long period events, um, have, a, have a long period, low frequency coda to the signal. Uh, and this tells us that um, this is really related, we think, to some sort of resonance in the fluid portion of, of the magma reservoir as magma is on the move towards very shallow levels. We tend to see these um, occurring in swarms, lots of events together when we have very high extrusion rates and magma is pushing towards the surface. Um, and also one of the main other types of signal you see is surface flows, mass flows from either rock falls or pyroclastic flow signals. They have this characteristic sort of emergent onset um, and sort of cigar shaped envelope. Uh, and they occur very frequently when we have lava extrusion in the dome is shedding material. So as well as these sort of other, these main volcanic types, we also see lots of other types of signals. Uh, if we have heavy rainfall, we can have lahar signals, which produce um, signal that looks a bit like a rockfall. You look at the time scale, this is much longer over sort of the several minutes. They can be, can last longer than that. Uh, and this is due to the passage of um, material in some of the major drainages as, as heavy rainfall occurs and the lahar moves down some of these valleys. And also on the bottom, I was just an example to show the sort of uh, swarm behavior. So when we have very rapid events occurring, um, here we have sort of events occurring every minute or two, um, but they can sometimes occur so quickly they merge into continuous tremor. So that's the first sort of uh, key role is this routine analysis of classifying and looking at the, any events that have been triggered from the volcano. And we do this through a manual uh, package called Sizan. We have this installed on a couple of machines, myself and, and Venus are analyst. Um, and this is what we use to do our manual classification of events to produce the sort of database of and uh, catalog of volcanic events that used to produce counts and for the weekly reports and things like that. It's also how we uh, produce um, high percentages. We can pick phases um, on PNS wave arrivals and magnitudes to do sort of routine normal um, analysis of seismic events <coughs> and produce focal mechanisms, et cetera. So as you would uh, do with, with regular tectonic earthquakes. Okay, so as well as that sort of core part of the monitoring, um, other operational duties um, involve sort of manning the operations rooms, the ops room duties. Um, so this is a, a panoramic shot, hope you can see, of our, of our operations room. Um, there's normally three of us in there, three is three staff um, that man the operations room. Um, and one of the main uh, reasons for this is we have a, a hazard level system on the island to sort of manage the hazard into the of the volcano and we, the island is divided into these um, different terrestrial hazard zones as well as offshore zones because plastic flows can travel over the sea. Um, so really access to these different zones mainly uh, A, B and C and, and zone V around the volcano is controlled by the level of activity. Um, but at the moment we are at hazard level one which means um, all of these zones A, B and C are fully open 24 hours a day there's no restrictions. But we have what's called control access into zone V um, yeah, so you can see the alert level as it, the alert level changes access to these different zones would, would change and if we got up to very high activity we may have to think about evacuating some of these areas. Um, so at the moment we have uh, various official visits into Plymouth, we have MVO staff doing field work, we have the jetty in Plymouth, the former jetty in the capital of Plymouth being used to export um, sand from mine from the Bellum Valley that's loaded onto barges and we've started in the last few years having more and more tourist trips by licensed taxi operators into Plymouth and for all of those um, we have to have someone in, in the ops room manning the radio so we can keep in constant communication with whoever's working inside or visiting inside zone B. So that's become a bigger and bigger part of the sort of day-to-day -day role. So as well as the, the radios there is obviously what would happen in the an emergency in the event of a sudden increase in activity. Well to do that, we have basically uh, call down lists of different people who would need to alert depending on the type of event or, or what would happen. So that could involve alerting the local authorities. So alerting the police to sound the sirens, um, talking to the premier and the governor here on Ireland, uh, but also could involve airports. Obviously ash is a big aviation hazard. So if we had a significant amount of ash up to certain levels in the atmosphere, we would have to alert uh, airports regionally, but also we can even call the Washington back the Volcanic Ash Advisory Centre and they can think about um, rerouting air traffic in, in, in the region. Um, so the, the Ops Room is not manned 24 hours a day at the moment because 
activity is fairly low and we don't have people operating outside of sort of normal hours inside the hazard zone. Um, but we do have alarm systems that are linked to the seismicity. So um, we have a duty rotor, duty scientist rotor, but obviously being a seismic alarm, I have to respond to everything. So I'm basically a seismologist is, is, is always on duty. Um, yes, and all of these different roles are really very variable. It depends on the level of activity. Obviously it can range from hundreds of events per day and you can be extremely busy dealing with all of this to at the moment where activity is comparatively low and you have a little bit more time for your research activities. Just to explain a bit more about the alarms and how we do the monitoring from outside, uh, we have access to a lot of this data from, from outside of the observatory via the internet and on our mobile phones. So we can log in if there's an alarm and see whether we need to respond further. Um, but the alarm is based on a RSAM, which is a real-time seismic amplitude measurement, so a sort of average amplitude. And um, we have amplitude thresholds that if they're exceeded at several stations, it triggers an alarm. Um, this is often false or fake, uh, false alarms due to large teleseismic earthquakes or big regional earthquakes, but it can also obviously be triggered by volcanic activity, which is really what we're looking out for. Um, and if this occurs, it sends out phone calls and email alerts to all the staff, and then we can respond if, if necessary. Okay, so moving on from the operational side of things, as well as doing all of that, um, I have some more sort of technical duties that I'm gonna quickly quickly go through. Um, so as a seismologist, I have overall responsibility for maintaining the, the seismic network. So the instrumentation and the hardware, um, don't do this alone. I have some excellent colleagues, technical colleagues, technicians who help me out and do a lot of the, the field work in preparation with that. Um, and I've said never ending task, and I guess it is, it sometimes feels a bit like spinning plates. There's always things breaking, going wrong. It's quite a harsh environment, particularly when activity is high, there can be ash on the solar panels and things. So there's always constant maintenance and things to do. Uh, the big task at the moment is obviously, even though activity is low, vegetation grows very quickly, covers the solar panels. So we have to go and bush out and, and maintain all of the sites. Um, so just to show you what the network looks like, this is the current Dysman network. Um, it's a mix of mostly broadband instruments. So these are Garab uh, 40T broadband instruments. But we also have several short period single component stations, as well as these triangles shown in black are spiders. These were given to us by the USGS. These are um, designed to go into locations where uh, we wouldn't necessarily have a permanent station. They're designed to be a frame that you attach instruments to and deploy sort of rapidly by helicopter. So we have a few of those. And the telemetry is all real time via. Uh, radio links that comes back to the observatory in real time. Just to show you a couple of photos, this is one of the spiders being deployed. This is Heiko doing a very rapid installation by the foot of the collapse scar. Um, most of our stations we can only access by helicopter. Um, and this is another shot showing you one of the stations in the field. You can see the rack of solar panels to power the, power the site. And then this is the, the instrumentation box and the seismometer will be buried a few meters away in the ground and then telemetered back with the, with the radio antenna. So this is the fairly typical installation of the sites in the field. As well as that sort of hardware and instrumentation aspect, um, the seismologist also has responsibility for doing a lot of the software side of things, so maintenance of the acquisition and processing software and development of any new uh, monitoring techniques. And that involves working in a range of different computing environments, so I have to use Linux, different formats, flavors of Linux, uh, Windows, Mac OS X, so you have to be very flexible in terms of sort of computing um, skills. And I'm also responsible for sort of managing the, the sort of large amounts of data that we, that we acquire. Um, sort of continuous data from several stations, lots of channels sampled, at high sampling rate is quite a large volume of data. It has to be carefully managed along with the metadata um, and doing sort of quality control and checks on that. And that all is also part of the day-to-day -day role of managing um, the seismic data. Um, so the way to do that, the software we use is what we call um, proprietary Garap Scream software. This is what we use to do the main acquisition. It connects to the instruments in the field. Um, we can control the digitizers. And basically this just grabs the, the first step in, in grabbing the data. Um, and then this gets passed on to our main uh, processing software, which is something called Earthworm. And that does a lot of the actual real-time processing of the events. So this is, um, basically a whole set of different modules, each with specific tasks. Um, it does a lot of the real-time processing of data. So it does a lot of the event triggering, for example, calculates RSAM and does the alarm calls, 
produces helicopters and does all the data archiving. So a lot of the processing is, 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 is automated through this. And I have the role in sort of maintaining and making sure everything's working as it should do. Um, but just to point out that a lot of this can um, require sort of out of hours or emergency response because seismic um, activity is one of the first precursors and seismology is one of the few real time techniques we have. So if we lose seismic monitoring, particularly in, in a crisis period, then we're in sort of big trouble. So if things go wrong, I'm often required to come in weekends or even in the middle of the night to come and address issues if we've had hardware failures or computer problems or power issues. Um, we do have a generator at the observatory, but still sometimes we can have large power outages and things can go wrong. Um, so it can be challenging to try and respond quickly to some situations such as those. Um, so just to kind of wrap up on a few more other <clears throat> duties that I, that I have, the other duties besides the sort of monitoring and technical things. Um, so I do report writing. We all contribute to the six monthly report. Um, so this is not for scientific, uh, for peer review, as for a journal article, but it's still very much the same sort of skills. Um, we all, all contribute to this six monthly report that goes out into the public domain, but also to the scientific advisory committee. And then we meet and discuss the latest activity. Um, a lot of the sort of interaction with the local authorities actually goes through the director, unless it's a real emergency. That's something called the NDPRAC, which is the National Disaster Preparedness Committee, which involves NVO, the, gov uh, the governor, the premier, the police, and they actually meet and have responsibility for setting the hazard level and or evacuations, etc., under normal circumstances. And that normally goes through the NVO director, but obviously other staff can contribute and have been acting director or in an emergency situation, we, we, we would act. Um, and I also contribute, as I was mentioning, to these SAC meetings. So this is um, an annual meeting where we have the scientific advisory committee um, who come from off island experts from around the world we come and have a, a week-long meeting to discuss the latest data um, and they produce a report that goes to the government here and also to the fco the foreign and commonwealth office in the uk with their recommendations um, and a part of that is a what we call an expert elicitation process so that's where we the scientists and the sac members provide their um, probabilistic estimates of different scenarios and this is combined into a QRA, a quantitative risk assessment um, that gives us the level of risk in the different hazard zones that forms a key part of, of, of the report. So MVO staff obviously contribute you know, significantly to that whole process. Okay, so I'm finally just to wrap up with the last couple of slides is really focusing on some of the other sort of non-scientific and non-technical things that I do. Um, that's mostly working with sort of education and outreach activities. So we regularly give um, tours of the observatory and tours of the ops room to lots of different people. Um, obviously, we have many visitors and many want to see how the scientists work and what we do. So uh, that happens quite a lot. Uh, I've given many talks and presentations to visiting uh, student groups from sort of nursery school up to graduate, postgraduate level. So a whole range of different um, educational groups. And NVO also does a lot of outreach working with the wider public. We have an open day every year and also part of Montserrat Science Week where we give public lectures or public demonstrations about some aspects of uh, volcanic activity or the geohazards. And we also have a weekly, uh, monthly, sorry, radio show on the local radio station uh, where we discuss latest activity and different staff members go on the radio show and talk about whatever's happening in the last few weeks um, and, and sort of help inform the wider public about what MBA is doing. So they're the sort of the, yeah, the main sort of key different educational outreach things we do. So yeah, talking to visiting groups, um, yeah, talking on the radio, giving public lectures, all of that also takes up you know, a fair chunk of time when, when we have a lot of visitors to, to the observatory. So hopefully you've still been listening and I think that is, um, I think that's about all I have to say. So thank you. <laughs> I'm happy to take questions on call. Cool. So, not sure how this is going to work, but I'll do my best to try and answer your questions how we get around to doing it.
Hello? You can hear me? Hello? Yes, okay, I can hear you. Okay. Yes, I'm here, yeah, yeah. Um, well, well, I guess it's the fact that it's um, had quite a long eruption now. It's been going on for 23 years. So I think, you know, it's the length of time that it's, it's been going on. I think obviously when the eruption started, it wasn't particularly well monitored. Um, it would be like the, I'm, I'm going to put the phone down because I can hear myself. So hopefully you can hear me through the screen. Okay, so yeah, the, the, the current eruption, yeah, has been ongoing for a long time, but prior to the, the eruption, there was just a few instruments here. It was maybe three or four seismometers, and that, that was all there was, which is very much like a lot of the other islands in the region are. Um, you know, in such, certainly in sort of Dominica, St. Vincent, um, they, they don't have as much infrastructure monitoring-wise as, as we do here. But I think, obviously, if something happens, we, there would be a very rapid response to that. Um, I think it's also partly because it's, uh, UK overseas territory, so it has access to a lot more funding support through the UK government than maybe some of the other independent islands would. I think if you look at also, say, the French islands in Martinique and Guadeloupe, they also have very well funded and well staffed observatories that maybe some of the other islands don't. So I think it's kind of a combination of funding aspect from, from the UK, but also the sort of longevity of the eruption that's the reason for this kind of very well established observatory. So I hope that answers the question. Yes, I can hear you. Um, yeah, I'll put the phone down again, hang on. Um, okay. Yes, we do. I mean, so obviously the, sick, the scientific staff are all actually, you know, employees of the Seismic Research Center, so we all help definitely in, in monitoring the other islands. Um, um, so, for example, Thomas Christopher is involved in lots of projects doing gas monitoring in, in St. Vincent, in St. Lucia, um, in Dominica. Um, and obviously, we're all involved in the recent activity at Kick and Jenny. Um, a lot of the, they don't have anyone with such volcanic seismology expertise in, in seismic because there's two of us here, myself and Rod. But we were looking at a lot of the data coming in from Kick and Jenny and giving our input and advice into that. So, yes, we, we collaborate extensively with other. Um, activity in the region and, and we get yeah, because we're all employees of the same organization really obviously our main focus is Montserrat but I'm sure if there was a huge crisis developing at one of the other islands we would definitely go and help out because activity at the minute here it is it's fairly low so. okay Yeah, there's, I think it was named by a US submarine survey. There's Kick'em Jack and Kick'em Jenny. I, I'm not really sure quite where the names come from, but that's, yeah. So it was only discovered, you know, quite quite recently. It, it was, because it's submarine, the, the summit is maybe 200 meters below the surface. So it was only discovered sort of during, yeah, during World War II. I think that's a problem. Yes, I, th I assume that was applause. <laughs> it's kind of strange talking to myself. Okay, cool. Hope you enjoyed it and th thanks for inviting me. <laughs> okay, bye everybody.